Okay, so good morning. This is the first class in the, the book that's called Defiance and Devotion. It's selected as it says, selected discourses dating from the arrest and liberation of the previous Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson in 1927. Um, I'm wondering, so we just finished a series also from the from the previous Rebbe, from the Friedrich Rebbe, and I think it, the women enjoyed it so much, we decided to continue with more of his teachings. Um, we're going to start with the publisher's foreword because the publisher's foreword has a lot of the historical background to it and explains sort of what the buildup and the, and the history around these Maimaran. Um, the, 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 the height of these Maimaran is the holiday of Yud Beis Tammuz, which was the which is in the summer and it's the liberation of the previous Rebbe, as we're going to see. I'm wondering if maybe we'll be able to finish it by then and make a stand, you know, in time for, for that as well. That would be like amazing. So we'll see how, if we can do that. Well, I don't know. We'll see how long it takes. Um, so as I it put in the email, the link to the book online, you can, you know, you can just, you can just follow that email and you can, and you can have you can have a virtual copy of the book, you know, read it on your computer as we're reading it, or you can obviously you can order the book from 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 Kahas, I believe. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, from Kahas. So either way, but I put an email. I put a link so you can follow that link because we'll read the publisher's forward first. So in 1927. After incitement by the Yevtsetsia, the virulently anti-religious Jewish section of the Soviet Communist Party, yes, there was a Jewish section of the Soviet Communist Party, and of course they were the most anti-religious, you know, anti-Semitic part of the whole party. The sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, um, the saintly Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, and as it says in the footnote, he's known as the Rayat. That's a common way. If you if you ever hear the term the Rebbe Rayat, that refers to the previous Rebbe. We in Yiddish we say the Friedrich Rebbe, which means the previous Rebbe, or the Rayat is the acronym Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. That's like um, or Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak really, um, which is an acronym for his name. You know, like uh, Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchak. It was not uncommon to call. Rabbanim, you know, by their acronym of their name. So sometimes if you see the term Rabbi Rayat, it's the same as meaning the, the previous Rebbe, the same as meaning the Friedrich Rebbe, the same as re meaning Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson. All those are the same, um, the same person, basically. So um, in 1927, after the incitement by the Assetia, the Rebbe Rayat, the previous Rebbe, was incarcerated under capital arrest in Leningrad interrogated, tortured, and exiled until ultimately and miraculously he was liberated. It was a huge miracle, which well, you know, well, we have learned about, we'll learn more about, but it was a huge miracle, right? It's very uncommon for somebody to be put and sentenced, as the Rebbe would say, to the opposite of life, and then all of a sudden not only be let free, but like let out of Russia. The five discourses in this volume all date from that period surely one of the most agonizing and turbulent epochs in all of our turbulent and agonizing history. So the Maimarim that we studied, he was in America already. It's a completely different time in his life. These Maimarim are from like this time in his life when he was under threat of terrible opposite of life, as they said, right? If you, if you look at the footnote, it says the chronological connections between these discourses and his arrest on the 15th of Sivan, his reprieve from imprisonment and from capital sentence on Gimel Tamas, and his release from exile on Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas are explained in the respective paragraphs which orient the reader before each of the five Maimarans. So as we get to each of them, we'll see what, you know, when they were said specifically, but they were all part of this cycle of events that ended up in his arrest and ultimately in his liberation. The superficial historian might thus be tempted to conclude that this noble epoch of literal self-sacrifice for the rescue of Jew's threatened soul gave rise to these discourses. They appear so obviously to have sprouted out of the spiritual soil of those times. 
The opposite, though, is even truer. These discourses gave rise to this noble epoch and this time of little self-sacrifice, the rescue of Jewry's threatened soul. I mean, what's the difference between these two ideas? This is from the publisher, right? That, in other words, that the, that the spiritual, the spiritual um, strength <clears throat> and life force that we get is what al and allows us to accomplish what we accomplish on a physical level, right? So these maimarim are the things that he's um, proposing are the things that actually gave the Jews the strength to be able to go through that turbulent time. What is the potent message in these and many other Maimarim Hasidic discourses that empower them to deflect the natural course of Jewish history? Meaning, what, how did these Maimarim enable the Jews to get the strength to withstand what they were going through and even overcome what they were going through and wind up where on the other end in, with strength and, and connection to Hashem and so on. Above all, they embodied an explicit and fearless call to defy the Soviet regime, even at the cost of life itself. Right? We, we are, we have, over the years, we studied many things about the previous Soviet, especially in the way that he stood up to the Soviets it, with complete defiance and a total lack of showing any kind of fear. Um, many stories, many examples of this, right? From the time that he was you know, dragged in for the interrogation when he was originally arrested and they asked him for his name and his address. And he, and he responded, if you don't know my name and my address, how do you know that you got the right man? Maybe you arrested the wrong person. Don't you know my name and address? Like, why are you asking me this, right? <laughs> so like from that kind of you know, strength and defiance, that's why it's called defiance. <laughs> And devotion, right? Defiance to the Soviet regime, devotion to the Avister, right? Like where that's that's what those are those two those two qualities coupled together is what we're all trying to inculcate into ourselves from the previous Rama. A dramatic example of this is the very first mimer in this volume. When the author's successor, the seventh Rebbe of Lubavitch, Rebbe Nachum Mendel Ashnirsen, who we just called the Rebbe, republished it in 1951, right after Rebbe, he chose to append a, commentar a, com a contemporary document, a letter in which a certain rabbi records a, a factual and artless description of those days by one of the many stalwart communal functionaries who continued to serve their flock against all odds. This communal leader, who was not a chassid, relates how one day, one Sunday in 1927, the GPU, formerly called the NKVD, part of the Soviet uh, interrogation, uh, interrogated him so incessantly about the current movements of the Rebbe Rayats that he immediately begged one of the elder chassidim to urge the Rebbe Rayats to leave the city that very night. Now, this was not uncommon. People would be interrogated. And then they would give warning to whoever the subject of the interrogation was about because it meant that they were on somebody's list and they were trying, you know, they're trying to gather information to trump up charges to arrest them and basically, I say, liquidate them, as they would say, you know. Little, little wonder, therefore, that on the following Thursday evening, which was Purim Katan, Purim Katan happened when there's a leap year and there's two others. So the first Adar on the 14th of Adar, which is the date of Purim, we have what's called Purim Katan. It's a, a called a small Purim. It's a, just like a celebration of a special day, but it's not but Purim. Purim is in the second Adar. So uh, uh, the following very easy, which was Purim Katan, as he was walking down Moscow's Arkipova Street, I don't know, Allah, did I pronounce that properly? he was stunned to discover that the Lubavitcher shul was brightly lit up. In other words, he had given warnings to the, Rebbe, the previous Rebbe to flee, and now he's walking by the Lubavitcher shul and it's lit, lit up brightly. Hundreds of Hasidim crowded its porch and circus, even though every man there clearly knew that the presence there of the Rebbe Rayat and his own attendance there endangered the, endangered the lives of them all. I mean, gathering for a religious purpose <laughs> under Soviet rule was 
taking your life into your hands, basically. And now they, they, they're they on the trail, so to speak, of the previous job, they're interrogating people about him. Like, I mean, this was obviously putting their lives in danger. Curious, the passerby, right, this, this rabbi who had been interrogated, entered there, uh, entered and heard the counter-revolutionary message of the Rabbi Yasser, loud and clear. What's this counter-revolutionary message? Herm's battle of the spirit, in which the brute force of an anti-Semitic despot was vanquished by the pure breath of little children who were taught Torah by self-sacrificing teachers, is repeated in every generation. Meaning that's the story of Purim, right? <laughs> there was an anti-Semitic leader who was trying to destroy the Jews, and Mordechai gathered 22,000 Jewish children, and they davened, and they said to Hillel, and there was a miracle. So the previous was saying, look, <laughs> This is repeating itself in every generation. Here we are. This is what we have to do, you know. The, admir um, the admiring listener's amazement was soon cut short. Observing a number of overly attentive individuals who appear to be spies of the GPU, he quickly left. Meaning, it, it, it's not just that the Hasidim were there. The Soviets planted people who looked like Jews, you know, they would, uh, who were like, what do you say, you know, like spies basically. So he he noticed them. And so he didn't want to be caught as one of the people who was there, so he left. And indeed, exactly four months later, the Rebbe Ayats himself together with many of those present was arrested, you know, from that gathering. That gathering became known as a gathering that, that sort of propelled on a physical level, the arrest of the Rebbe and many other Hasidim. Not that imprisonment was a novel experience for him, for the previous Rebbe. He had already tasted the first of his seven prison terms when he was nine years old, but none was as, excru as excruciating as the incarceration of 1927. So when he was already a young child, he was already, there's a story, you know, you could read all the stories about it. When he, was not, when he was nine years old, he was already arrested for the first time because he saw a Russian officer uh, basically beating up a Jew and he like jumped on the officer and he started, you know, pounding his fists on the officer to like let go of this Jew who hadn't done anything. And of course he was arrested for attacking the officer. The officer, you know, made a trumped up charge. Uh, he, pull, he, he pulled off his own badge and put it in his pocket. And he told, you know, he told the judge that he had, that the kid had pulled off his badge. It became a whole situation. Uh, he was, uh, he was taken at, he was released from prison, but, um, and that's a whole nother story in its own self, what he learned there and what we what we learn. I mean, I could, maybe I'll just tell the story quickly that that, that teaching, um, and when he was put into the prison, his father was out of town. When he was put into the prison, he was put into a dark cell. And while he was in the dark cell, so he, and he started saying Mishnayas by heart. Um, so, you know, some of the teachings of the oral Torah by heart that, that his father had been telling him to study. Uh, so he knew them by heart and he started studying them. And he started to hear, and he heard some like moaning sounds and it was very dark. So he didn't know where the, who, what was the cause of these moaning sounds. He was very scared. Um, but he remembered he had some matches in his pocket. And so he lit a match to see what was happening. And he saw that there was a, um, a, sh a sheep or a goat or a cat, so, some animal tied up in the corner of the cell. And he continued doing his learning. Anyway, his father heard about the arrest. The, you know, the, husband, the, father, the father spoke to the, the, the department. I think at that time it was still under the czar. So they had some clout and he was taken out um, and he was you know, brought in front of the judge. The chassid would come. I don't remember all the exact details, but the chassid would come to represent the Rebbe Shab, you know, in front of the judge with this police officer. And he, he said that you're being, you know, the kid was being tried for pulling off the police officer's uh, badge. He said it's, you know, he took it off himself, it's in his pocket. So they searched the officer's pocket and it was there. Um, and they said, they're gonna let the boy go. And the boy said to them, why, like, why are you letting me go only? There's, what, what is the problem with this little calf? Why, what did, what did she do wrong that she's tied up in, in the prison? Because they had accused the Jew, the, this this guard or this officer had accused the Jew of stealing the calf. So now he, you know, exposed the whole fact that everything had been trumped up and the officer had framed the Jew. And so they found the calf, they let the calf go, they they disciplined the officer, and the Jew was also let off. And his father told him afterwards, you know, when he came back and he 
spoke to his father about uh, what had happened. His father said, you know, like, good for you. You stood up, you stood up for a Jew. You had a serious message for a Jew. And okay, you sat in prison for a few hours, but like, good for you that you, that you stood up for a Jew. Um, and look at, look at what you look, look at the situation, both you and this cow or calf was sitting in, pre in prison. What was the difference between you and the calf? You were both locked up in the prison. What was the difference? The only difference is that you were able to sit and learn Torah while the calf just sat there. So, you know, sort of let that be a lesson that, you know, that you, that you had something productive and holy to do while you were, while you were waiting for it to be released. So, you know, we see that from a very young age, the previous one had Mr. Snefesh for another Jew. That was his first of seven arrests. This was his harshest, is his last and harshest arrest. Um, okay, so back into the text. So though he found it more difficult to demand self-sacrifice of others than, than of himself, at a Fabring in a few years earlier, he had once asked, for a core of team of faithful helpers who would undertake at all costs to organize shiurim for adults, establish underground chadarm for children. So shiurim means classes, right? To have Torah classes for adults, establish underground chadarm for children. It means to have um, underground um, um, schools for children, maintain a valid mikvah wherever they found themselves and so on meaning they, he called together basically a minion and made a pact with them. In response, nine of these key volunteer activists met, met secretly soon after in Moscow and entered into a covenant with him and that they would pursue their tasks until the last drop of blood. In other words, this, this was, and some of them did actually give up their lives in the process. Um, but this pact of these 10, this minion that made this like covenant basically that they were gonna keep Yiddishkeit alive in Russia is what kept Yiddishkeit alive in Russia. Uh, there's a beautiful there's a beautiful video. I don't know if they made it into a DVD. We showed it once at a woman's program way back in the days of videos called Embers, um, which talks about this time in, and, what, and what the previous job was set up in Russia to keep Yiddishkeit alive. Um, the embers and then how they burst into flame when communist, when communism fell and they were able to have Yiddishkeit open again. So um, anyway, if it's available, maybe it's available on YouTube now. I, I highly recommend that people, that people watch it um, or you know, maybe we can make time one class to watch it. If, if, it's a, if it's actually on YouTube, we can maybe do it one of these classes as well. If you wanna watch it together. It's a, a very worth, it's, it's really beautiful, very, very powerful. But this is the minion, and you know, and and some Hasidim made it out, and you know. Okay, in 1920, with the passing of his father, the fifth Rebbe of Lubavitch, Reb Shalom Bereshnerson, we known as Reb Rashab, the 39-year-old Reb Yosef Yitzchak found himself thrown into the leadership of the Chabad Hasidic community. You can imagine. In the wake of World War One. The revolution of 1917, the communist revolution, and the anarchy and pillages of the battle between the Nitkins Cossacks and the New Red Army, the Russia that confronted him was impoverished and seething with re religious persecution. It's, I mean, and, and then the Holocaust, as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> I mean, this is when the previous Rebbe was the leader, right? You know, he, had, he was a leader under the harshest regime until the Nazis probably. Um, and they say Stalin killed more people than Hitler, but it was since it was behind closed doors, nobody ever found out about it. Um, but the communists were, were you know, who you, you can't compare terror, you can't compare who's worse, communists or, or the Nazis, but it says, you know, they say that Stalin killed more people than, than even Hitler did. They were completely under his rule and it was, and there were, there was no, um, there, there was no leakage to the outside world of what was going on, like there was in, in World War II, where there was media coverage and there were, you know, there was, there's just more countries involved, so more information got out eventually. In the beginning, also information would get out, right? But I don't even know if people still know everything that happened under Stalin's rule. So this is when the, this is when the previous rebel was leading and, and specifically what was trying to be done was to completely wipe out religion, right? 
comrade, all this kind of stuff. Even though on the books it was it was illegal, but not in reality. Thirty nine years old. <laughs> Painful as it is to record, the fact is that his most relentless enemy was the above mentioned Yevsetskaya, the Jewish section of the Soviet Communist Party, which is unfortunately, that also repeats itself in history, right? Unfortunately. In a frenzy of loyalty to the party, its members exploited their linguistic and personal connections to serve as spies and informers, right? That's, they, they, they knew things, they, they, they knew how to, passes from Yiddin. They knew the language, they knew the customs, they knew how to do things, right? I mean, unfortunately this happened under the, 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 the Spanish Inquisition, it happened under Nazis, it, 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 there, it, it can happen. In one town, for example, a young man flaunted his zeal by reporting his venerable father's activity in maintaining the local mikvah. His superiors duly rewarded him by charging him with the task of personally wresting its keys from his hands. I mean, the members of the Yevtsekskia monitored the mail and movements of their townsmen and staged public trials of underground teachers, which led to exile and torture in Siberian labor camps. You know, they, again, they had inside information, much more easily accessible than the Soviets could have on their own. Institutions were also put on trial. The first cheder to be tried and closed was that of Itebs. The first yeshiva to be tried and closed was that of Rostov. And true, and true to the Bolshevik, tradition, the verdicts were commonly written before the trials began. That, that was their minhug. That was, a, that was the minhug. They decided what the fate was, and then they had the trial. <laughs> you know, that, that was how they did things there. In fact, you know, we know that many times in the underground, underground yeshivas, underground, the, they did it, they only, everybody only knew their first names. Nobody knew last names. The kids didn't know the last name of their teacher. The teachers didn't know all the time the last names of the students. People just knew first names so that God forbid somebody was captured and tortured to find out you know, who was involved, they couldn't even give information because they didn't have it. So um, sometimes the, 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 those who made it to America, uh, they found out their last names then, <laughs> you know, who, who, who their teacher was, who their, who their fellow students were and things like that. Lacking the advantage of historical hindsight, the self-hating Jews of the Yevsetsia can hardly be blamed for their short-sightedness. They could hardly be expected to know that every single one of them was eventually going to be charged with, with treachery to, cause, to the cause of the revolution and unceremoniously liquidated in Stalin's purges. You know, they, they, thought they, were, they thought they were gonna get themselves um, some kind of uh, amnesty, is that what you, is that the term? And ultimately they were all killed anyway. It's not uncommon either. The, yes, sorry, you have a question? If you're speaking, um, you're still muted. Yeah, I just, I, I just unmuted. Um, yeah. I, I, it, it's just dawning on me, do we, from, from the nine volunteers, do we know who they were? We do. We do know who they were. Some of them. I mean, uh, Shemtov was one of them, right? That that's. Uh, we know who some of them were. I don't know. We may know who all of them are. I right now I can't bring to mind all of them, but some came back to. It. So I think two survived. Shemtov, and I can't remember who the second one is. Was Rep. Mendel Futterfass one of them? And don't I don't know. know. I don't. Not, I never. Okay. I didn't hear that. I don't. Right now, I can't call to mind. I could try to find out. Uh, I was. I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I could try to find out, Mr. Shen. Um. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Sure. The fearless stand of the Rebbe Rayat bore fruit in thousands of times and places. Probably every reader of these lines has listened in amazement to incredible first person accounts of the courage in the face of this brutal religious oppression. There are many stories, there are biographies that have been written in recent years that you can read about Hasidim who lived through that time and you know what they dealt with and, and accomplished. And plus you can read the Rebbe Rayat's own thing, own books, you know, uh, about um, his arrest and liberation. 
For years on end, one well-known Mashbia declined opportunities to be released from imprisonment until he had managed to fabricate documents, a capital offense, that would spirit every possible fellow Jew out of the USSR. The learned author of the Gulag Memoirs entitled Sobota, which means the Sabbath observer, Reb Lazar Nanis, lived a life of self-sacrifice that cost him 20 years in Siberia. You, you could read that book. It's still available called Sabbat. It's very hard, very, very hard to read, to, to, to hear what he went through. Um, at, but for those years in Siberia, in the Siberian labor camp, he kept Shabbos every Shabbos. That's why they called his book Sabbat. But the tortures that he went through in order to accomplish that and the tortures he went to went through that, res that resulted in his exile to the Siberian labor camp. Um, you know, not, nothing, no crimes, just Tara um, It's very, it's very hard to read. We had thought perhaps to do it as one of the, I mean, I read it like, you know, 30 years ago or more. And I, I started to re-look at it to, to see if it could be one of our book club books. And it, it felt like it was just too intense to, you know, if people want to read it on their own, but it's like too intense. At the other end of the country in Russia, Georgia, in Russian Georgia, not American Georgia, but, um, a young Hasidic woman lay down on the street in front of a bulldozer that was storming its way towards the local shoal and lived to tell the tale. Um, if you look at the footnote, it says one of the few humorous episodes of those days took place in the same province. In the early 1920s, a confident young Lubavitcher Hasid toured its Jewish community, reading out to those clauses, reading out those clauses of the revolutionary constitution, which at least nominal, nominally permitted religious activity. As we said, like on the books, it was, it was legal. It was just, you know, we have a friend who says, theoretically and practically, theoretically, there's no difference between the theoretical and the practical, but practically, there's a big difference between the theoretical and the practical. You know, theoretically, religion was permitted under Soviet rule. Practically, it was not really, it was not. So he found all the clauses in this revolutionary constitution. If everybody's equal, right? If everybody's a comrade, they can do whatever they want, really, uh, ultimately, right? Um, and he was reading aloud those clauses. As part of his spiel, which was aimed at encouraging the local people to dare to reestablish their destroyed synagogues and mikvahos, he generously praised the communist authorities for their religious tolerance. They're basically saying, look, this is what the communists are doing. We have talent there, they say this, they're, this, they're amazing. You know, like that's how he is putting it. He must have done this very convincingly because one of his listeners, a member of the Ispalka, the officially appointed municipal council, mistook him for a representative of the central government. Deeply impressed, he promised there and then to pay for the reconstruction of the local mikvah, and he kept his promise. <laughs> so you never know what can, uh, can be accomplished. <laughs> That was a, that was not such a common uh, situation. Many back into the text. Many other Hasidim too, some whose date and place of burial know, are known only to no man, right? Because they were liquidated, they were shot in the back of the head, you know, all sorts of terrible things. Some who have passed on from this world, and some who are eagerly awaiting the coming of Mashiach risked their lives in order to observe a single mitzvah or in order to save the life of a single stranger. One of the last survivors of that unique generation of self-effacing and self-sacrificing giants of the spirit was the diminutive Rabbi Reb, Reb, Reb Abba Pliskin of sainted memory. After dodging the NKVD for decades and finally leaving the USSR, this noiseless lamplighter introduced many of the Australian and American readers to the present works of the riches of Hasidus. In recent years, this extraordinary epoch has been increasingly documented by a flood of memoirs, interviews, and systematic historical accounts, both popular and scholarly. So if you look here, it tells you some of the, like the heroic struggle, that's the book about the previous driver. And then there's some other things here, if people want to, you know, look at more things, um, they give you some other ideas of it's footnote eight, in case you're on the digital copy, it's probably at the end of the article somewhere, but it gives you different things. If you're interested, you can look up and do more reading about this tang and so forth. Above all, the Rebbe Ayat's own account of his arrest and liberation is told in Rashima Samasar, 
which is due to appear in volume five of the English translation of his classic, the Kutte de Burin. It has been since translated and printed. Um, reading this document give, gives one an inkling of how the Hasidic teachings and the daily example of the Rebbe actually gave rise to a unique epoch in Jewish history. In other words, that the Rebbe encouraged and inspired a whole generation to be able to withstand Stalin and withstand the communists and be able to overcome that and still stay strong in their Yiddishkeit. Um, you know, who, who, however many people he could do was not an easy task, obviously. Uh, and unfortunately many people were lost, both physically killed and also spiritually lost because the, you know, it, it wasn't in the open it, it, or it wasn't in, like this is in the open in America, Baruch Hashem, right? It was, it was uh, but what, but there were many, many embers and so on and many things that were there fermenting. Um, the Rebbe Ratz once referred to the anniversary of his liberation. Okay, so we're jumping now to his liberation, which was on Yud Bez Yud Gimel Thomas, the 12th and 13th of Thomas, which is in the summer. Um, that you know started the, that that four month process that's that we're going to be learning these five Maimarim is and actually the last Maimar is from a year later on the anniversary of his release, um, which we actually learned in a different class many years ago that that particular Maimar, but he that 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 four months leading up to the arrest and then ultimately the liberation, he called the day of the liberation. Amaid Hamay Adam, the festival of festivals. Like, you know, the height of all the festivals kind of thing. Why? The Reb, so the Reb explained that this, this as follows, meaning the Reb explained why did the previous Reb um, call the 12th and 13th of Thomas when he was released, right? He was arrested and sentenced to, cap, you know, capital sentence. Um, which was commuted to harsh labor for 10 years. And then that was commuted to, he wound up being released, free, completely released after 12 days, you know, like, uh, or nine days. So it's like, a, kind of incredible. Um, so, and then he called that the festival of festivals. So the Rebbe explains that a festival marks the day in which a miracle was performed. Yud based Thomas marks a time and a miracle of general concern, meaning a miracle, um, involving the head of the Jewish people, a festival from which derive all particular festivals and miracles. So it, it affects all the Jews when when the head of when the head of a um, of a nation is, has a miracle done to him, then everybody is affected. On other occasions, the Rebbe showed us how to perceive this date from a cosmic perspective. We have been promised by the prophet Zechariah that in the time to come, the fast of the fourth month, which refers to the 17th of Tammuz, which commemorates the beginning of the destruction, will then be transformed into a day of gladness and joy. Ultimately then, the innermost essence of this mournful fast will be revealed as a time of gladness and joy. Hence the fact that the divine providence positioned yud based Tammuz in the same month makes this festive date the beginning of the revelation of the time to come. May we soon be privileged to witness this with our own eyes. Amen. Um, okay. The Maimarim, okay, so that's, any questions about this before we talk about like just the details? Okay. So Ignaz just says that my mom were so translated. Can I ask yeah. a question. Yeah. Yeah. So does is this this past thing which you just read? Does this mean that like somehow spiritually all the Jews in Europe at that time got some sort of power to withstand what they were going through, although they may not have been connected to him? Yeah. The group. Yeah, because see what happened. What we say. What we. What we're. Um, how Hasidus talks about a Rebbe, right? Like the concept of a Rebbe, a Rebbe is an acronym for the term Reish B'nai Yisrael. I mean, that's one way of explaining that word, which means the head of the Jewish people. So it talks about how there are collective souls. There's like, 
there's collective souls on a lot of different levels. The Zohar talks about collective souls. There's a lot of different, like Adam Harishon, the first man created was a collective soul. Um, and there's like five main collective souls that represent the five different levels of the soul. And in each generation, there's a head of the Jewish people who's a collective soul for that Jewish, that generation. Um, so like in the times of Purim, the, Rebbe, the previous Rebbe has my mom that talk about, you know, Mordechai, under Haman and Achashverosh, um, and you know, and then really the Maimer Alka Tetzava, I know Malka's favorite Maimer, you know, talks about this idea, you know, about how in every generation, so like who's the Mordechai of our generation, and the Rebbe would say the previous Rebbe was the Mordechai of our generation. So there's a concept of having like a, a Rebbe, a head, a leader, and not a, a head, meaning the same way in the body, the brain is connected to every limb and every organ and every sinew and every vein, everything, right? Um, and the health of that organ and limb and sinew is dependent on its connection to the head, right? We, if there's a sever between the brain and, you know, an arm or something like that, God forbid, the arm is paralyzed. It's there, but it's paralyzed, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it can't actualize its full potential. So it, it, there, we want to keep the, or like a stroke means that, you know, blood flow doesn't get to a certain part of the body, or we want to keep the blood flow going and we want to keep the, you know, things have to be connected to the heart and have to be connected to the head. But like the head is sort of the computer for the body, you know, like how it can work. So uh, like Rosh Hashanah is called the head of the year, a Rebbe is called the head of the Jewish people. So there's like a spiritual connection that every Jew in the generation has to the leader of that generation. So sometimes it's open and revealed and the person knows it and sometimes it's not. But because e even when a person themselves doesn't real don't realize how they're connected, but the Rebbe himself realizes the connection. And that's why, for example, you know, let's say our Rebbe, you hear all these stories about how he would send Hasidim to cities, you know, go here without instructions about what to do there, go find a Jew there. And, you know, there'd be a Jew somewhere who nobody ever heard of, who had been, you know, crying out to God for help and never would send somebody there to go help them. Um, I mean, thousands of stories like this, right? Like, because how does that happen? Because, because the Rebbe feels connected to each Jew. So like the brain feels the pain of the toe, even if the toe doesn't know it's connected to the brain, but the brain knows the toe is connected to it. And it feels the, it feels through the nerve system, the pain of the toe. So um, there's like so many, you know, so many situations like that. So as I say, how much better it is if we by ourselves realize that we need that connection and we get that connection by learning the Torah, hearing the stories, you know, seeing the Rebbe as a role model for us to try to inculcate, imbibe, permeate ourselves with those lessons and that way of being able to sort of take those lessons and apply them to our lives and our connection to Hashem, right? Um, there was really ultimately a role model in how we can serve Hashem. Um, and that's what he's trying to give us the strength to do. So, the, you know, when the Rebbe would write when our Rebbe would write letters before every he would he would address the letters to all the Jewish people wherever they are. He didn't address the letters to the Hasidim, you know, but address the, the these what they were called communal letters. I mean, some letters he addressed to individual people, some letters he addressed to groups of people, you know, some people, some letters he addressed to you know Neshei Chabad or you know whatever it is. But the letters before Yantif he addressed to all the Jewish people wherever they were in the world. That's how he, that was the, that was how he, what, what's that called? The opening of a letter, you know, I forgot the name, the official name, salutation, whatever. That's how he addressed the letters. So it was meant for, you know, he was writing a letter to every Jewish person about Rosh Hashanah and giving them wishes for a good new year and so on. Now it doesn't mean everybody, every Jewish person got to read that letter, but he was intending it for everybody. So here the Rebbe is saying when, a, when, when the previous Rebbe is the leader of that generation had what was called a Chag a redemption, it, did not, it doesn't just affect him. He's not an individual person. He's like a communal person. So there's a, an effect in the community of Jewish people when a leader has some kind of 
event like that, which actually the previous Rebbe himself in one of the my that we're going to study, God willing, mentioned something you'll see along the lines of like, is if this is a victory for all Jews. It's not just, a, it's not a personal victory. He wasn't a personal person. So his victory was really a victory for Yiddishkeit. He represented the nation. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. thank okay. you. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, so let's see. So let me just. Okay. So now, if you turn to the next page, um, or if you printed it out, whatever, so this is the first mimer, which is called Vikibel Hayyudim, Tafresh Pezan, which means uh, 1927, the Jews accepted what they had already begun. So this. This ha this mimer was said on Purim Katan, like we said, it was said on the in the first other when there's no Purim, but on the day of Purim. Um, parts of this mimer are quoted in Hechel in in So this is the this is the mimer of the previous Rebbe. So remember, this is the description of the scene that the for that the publishers forward described about how. This rabbi, a certain rabbi, was interrogated, and then he walked by the Lubavitch shul, and he saw it was bright. And he had he had given a few days earlier; he had given like the tip to the previous rabbi, suggesting that he flee. And instead of fleeing, a few days later, he sees he's holding a fabrenga for hundreds of chassidim in a brightly lit shul, you know, in the middle of Moscow. <laughs> Anything but fleeing and hiding out, right? So this is the mimer that he said, and you can you'll be able to see as we as we do the mimer why. And, and what is he talking about? How more like, like, and the whole nation defied, you know, defied Achashverosh. So it's like the exact opposite of a fleeing, right? As, as polar opposite as you possibly could get to fleeing is this mimer. So here we go. Okay, so one historic perm cuts on. Hundreds of Hasidim crowded into the modest wooden Lubavit shul that used to stand on the grounds of the imposing synagogue that still dominates Arkhipova Street in Moscow. Every single man clearly knew that the presence there of the Rebbe Rayats and his own presence there endangered the lives of them all. And in fact, exactly four months later on the 15th of Sivan, the Rebbe himself together with many of those presents was arrested. For the year was 1927, and they all knew that planted amongst them were secret agents of the dreaded NKVD. To make things worse, the fearlessly counter-revolutionary discourse that they were about to hear urged them to defy the Haman of their own days and to prepare themselves to sacrifice their lives quite literally in order to keep the underground Torah classes open for the last hope of Israel, their own little children. Right? That was one of the pre previous Rebbe's main Thrust. He says, well, if there's no kid goats, there's no adult goats. That we have to make sure that children are educated according to Torah mitzvahs. I'm sure those people who grew up under communist rule in Russia can attest to the fact that that was not a simple thing to try to accomplish. Some nine years later, in a, in a letter written in Atvask dated the 1st of Kislev, 1936, and addressed to Secretary for Educa Educational Affairs, Rabbi Chagakov, the Rebbe Rayat himself describes the events of that day. On Purim Katan in 1927, which fell on a Wednesday, I was in Moscow. The Chassidim and the Tmimim, the Tmimim are the, of the, are the boys who learn in the yeshiva, may they live and be well, organized the Fabringen to be held in the Lubavitch Shul. That same morning, I was informed that investigations were being made concerning me at my lodgings in the Sibirsky Hotel. So this, I guess that must have been from that rabbi. A secret agent was already counting my steps. Early in the morning, in the evening, I received news from Leningrad that, may we never know of such news, a person close to me had been arrested. 
In fact, among the Hasidim, fears were being expressed concerning me. And nevertheless, I did not want to cancel the Febrengen. So he, he got the message in time, right? That, that rabbi delivered message, his Hasidim were delivering messages. The Febrengen was held at the appointed hour. I delivered the mime, which began with, begins with the words, Vikiba Hayudim Es Asher Hechelu, which translates to that the Jews um, accepted what they began, basically. The concept of self-sacrifice for the sake of Torah and its mitzvahs is mentioned there several times. I place particular emphasis on the, those passages, ignoring the fact that the very walls had ears. Like he knew there were informers there. Later in the course of the Fabrinian, I repeated those words with an emphasis intended to arouse the hearts of my listeners to action in keeping with the needs of those days. And he did arouse the listeners to action. And, and that, I mean, you see, the results, Baruch Hashem, is that Yishkeit is very much alive and was able to regenerate um, after all those years under Stalin and communism and so on. Okay, so this is the beginning of the Mimer. So we'll, I guess we'll do a couple of paragraphs. That's probably all we'll get to. So it says, in the concluding passages of Megillus Esther, the, the concluding passages of Megillus Esther record that after the miracle of Purim, the Jews accepted what they had already begun. That was, it's at the end of the Megillah. You'll probably notice it this year if you haven't noticed it before, right? This verse can be interpreted to mean at this time in the era of the exile, the Jews accepted and internalized the process of spiritual progress that had begun previously at the time of the giving of the Torah. Meaning, they accepted, they re-accepted the Torah, what, what they had already begun. They had already, be, they had already begun to accept the Torah, right? The giving of the Torah had happened. But now at the time of Purim, after this miracle of Purim, they accepted what they had already begun. So it was like a new level of acceptance, a deeper level of acceptance of the Torah. This interpretation of this verse echoes the teaching of our sages in the Gemara Shabbos on the verse, Kimu the Kiblu Hayudim, the Jews affirmed, and accepted. The sages understand this verse to mean, which this verse is also from Adil Sester. Um, the sages understand this verse to mean that they now affirmed what they had already accepted when the Torah was given. Meaning, though the Jew, Jewish people had willingly accepted the Torah on Mount Sinai, it was not affirmed as an intrinsic, unalterable part of their beings until the events of Purim. That's what the Gemara says, meaning, or that's his explanation of what the Gemara is saying, that they accepted Torah at the giving of the Torah, and yet there was still something that wasn't like completely assimilated into their very being, permeated into their very being, and that's what happened at Purim. On the surface, this is an inconceivable statement. At the time of the giving of the Torah, the Jews had attained the loftiest heights of redemption, the most elevated levels of liberty and freedom, right? They've just been released from Egypt. Egypt was no picnic. <laughs> Egypt was a terrible exile. Under Haman was pretty bad. Under Pyro was pretty bad. And they just been, Egypt had just been completely decimated and the Jews accepted the Torah. Furthermore, they had witnessed numerous signs and wonders during their exodus from Egypt i.e. they had observed how the divine power and life energy which transcends the natural order became discernible and visible within nature itself, right? The, the, that's, this happened with the 10 plagues, right? The whole idea that Hashem was involved in the physical, nature doesn't just run itself. In particular, this was revealed in the splitting of the Red Sea, right? We are just learning all of these partials now. All these miracles happen. It was obvious God was involved in nature. Like if you look at the footnote, it says, as the sages taught, a mere maidservant witnessed more at the sea than did the prophets in their visions. Meaning they saw so much revealed godliness. It was like, a, 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 we would say it's a prophecy, a higher level of prophecy than some of the prophets who God spoke to in riddles and it wasn't so clear, right? This was clear godliness that they saw. When they reached Mount Sinai, they had thus attained the ultimate peaks where they apprehended godliness through direct sense perception. That's what was happening in the time of the giving of the Torah. They saw God. So why could we say, or how could we say that what they accepted at, 
Mount Sinai, when they received the Torah, when they saw God and they had just witnessed all these miracles and godly, godliness was completely perceived at a different, you know, at a level that was so much higher than ever before and ever since, how could we say that they completed the acceptance on a deeper level at Purim than they had at the giving of the Torah? It doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, we're gonna end here for now. This is really, we're only like halfway through the question. Now he's gonna explain the opposite. And in the times of Purim was exile darkness. So like, it makes the question even stronger. How could we say that at the time of Purim, they, you know, they accepted on a deeper level what they had started at Mount Sinai. So we sort of finished the first half building up how high they were at that time. But now the question will be strengthened by the second half. And then of course the mama is gonna address it and answer it. Okay. So thank you. All right for the ride. That's <laughs> oh, great. This is going to be a great. Sounds ride. exciting. Thank you. Okay, good. Good. Thank you.